also, I was reminded to remind everybody to please fill out the uh, evaluation forms at the end because that's what makes these talks possible. So thank you for that. Um, all right, so uh, we're gonna get this started. Uh, thank you for coming here on a 10 a.m. on t at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. We realized that getting people to get, getting game, devel game developers to do anything at 10 a.m. is difficult, much less to come to a talk. So thank you for being here, and uh, we promise to make it worth your while. So uh, I'm Rob Zubek. This is Matt Vienna. Uh, we are the founders of SomaSim, a uh, indie studio in Chicago. And this is our talk about running a post-apocalyptic games indie studio, or should I say running a post-apocalyptic indie studio. So what this means, we're gonna unpack in just a little bit. Uh, but generally speaking, this is uh, going to be a talk about the stuff we learned in the process of developing our latest game called Project Hungarys. It's released in September 2016, so uh, last fall. But when we started working on it several years ago, the market was very different, right? So we started with different assumptions and we ended in a market that was quite different. Uh, and this is going to be a talk about what the kind of stuff we've learned um, in the process of doing this and the process of doing the business side of it. And it's going to be a talk about the, actually the business and running a studio kind of things. And not so much about design or programming, although those will show up a little bit in there. So, what do I mean by the situation has changed, right? Um, so what happened uh, was, as, as we know with you know, the, the, the market changing and so on, um, we're going to illustrate with just a few numbers pulled off from the PC market. We're gonna talk about the PC market because that's traditionally the, been the most friendly one for indies such as ourselves. And specifically, I'm going to use numbers about, uh, from Steam and from Steam Spy because they are uh, publicly available and they are very easy to get. Uh, but the lessons are not going to be limited necessarily to Steam. Similar things you can see in other kind of storefronts and so on. So without further ado, let's talk about how the situation has changed over the last few years before we get to the meat of the talk. The first thing I want to look at is the number of games being published. And we've all seen the article show up online about how this year we've seen, you know, the, uh, the number of games on s released this year on Steam are the 30% of the total number of games and so on. Uh, but let's put it in perspective, right? As a timeline, what happened over, over the years? Uh, if we look back 2010, 11, and so on, very few games released every year, maybe a few hundred. I apologize. Um, and then 2013, something happens, right? There's an inflection point. Uh, at around that time, Steam introduces Greenlight and things change a little bit. Uh, now we see thousands of games released every year. Uh, this past year, the estimate is about 4,700, which, which is not unreasonable. If we look at the shape of the curve, it increases linearly and I'm, I was sort of extending it further. Uh, trying to estimate where things will be. If we keep the same velocity, then we're looking at 6,000 games a year this year, you know, before end of this year. So that's a lot of games, right? Uh, and when, uh, when we talk about the changing situation, this is our competition, right? This is, these are the kinds of uh, market situation that we have to look at. So will, they, will this velocity keep increasing? Who knows? But what we've seen in other media, uh, whether it's music, or ebooks or whatever, is that once we have a, an electronic distribution system that doesn't have uh, uh, you know, limitations on it, the number of con the amount of content increases, right? Num amount of music increases, amount of ebooks increases. There's no reason to think that we're going to see this curve slow down. So that's one kind of set of numbers I want to take a look at. Another set of numbers is what happens with this once we start adding it over time, which is the total number of games on Steam. And the total number of games, since we have this nice linear velocity, so adding it up, we get a nice quadratic kind of a thing. So it just keeps going up, right? And again, there's no reason to think this will slow down. Um, and the reason to think about the total number of games is because that's a different kind of competition too. The, on the previous slide, we saw the number of games being released concurrently, and that's important because we compete with them for attention, but the, the back catalog is what we compete against for sales. So for example, we re released Project Hires in uh, September of 2016. When we released it, 
uh, that week, I think there were 80 other games released just that week, plus DLCs and stuff. So when we got onto the new releases list, we dropped off immediately, right? I mean, it was, uh, uh, we got no traffic from that. Um, but the other, the second consideration is the back catalog. If the player is going to log into Steam or GOG or whatever, and they're gonna see our game, are they gonna buy it? Or are they gonna look at their wish list and say, you know what, that game is new and it's out for 20 bucks, but there's this game on my wish list that's 70% off that I've been dying to you know, buy it for two years now. I'm gonna buy that instead and wait for this one to go, right? Who here hasn't done that, right? This is a totally normal thing to do. And I apologize, I still, my uh, laugh seems to be going out a little bit. Um, I'm going to move it right here. Um, so we're, co we're looking at the back catalog as competition for sales. And the one more uh, thing that I want to look at is the demand side. Because we looked at the supply side, how many games are there out there. The supply side, what does that look like? And I, we don't have good numbers from Steam about the total number of accounts. But what, the, what they do publish is the number of concurrent players, uh, for example, every Christmas or every New Year's. And the, the exact number doesn't matter so much as the shape of the curve, right? The total number of concurrent players every year grows linearly. And if we use that as a stand-in for the total number of players, then we can see that the demand side grows linearly, and then the supply side grows like this. And this gap right there is the new situation that we're in. So given these kinds of numbers that we looked at, um, what does that mean for us? Uh, well, there's been a lot of talk about, is the indie apocalypse happening? Is it, is it a really a thing? It's not happening. It's, it doesn't matter, right? We're not going to necessarily uh, talk about this kind of thing. It doesn't matter. The situation has changed. Numbers speak for themselves, right? Uh, so in today, what we're going to talk about is given that the situation has changed, what can we do, sort of ourselves, you guys, all of us together, to adjust, to adapt ourselves to this new situation. So, uh, just a little bit of background about us before we get too much further into it. So we are, as I mentioned, SomaSim. Uh, we started our uh, studio in 2013. Uh, in, uh, we are based out of Chicago. And uh, first, uh, so first of all, 2013 was probably not the right time to start a studio, as, <laughs> as, you, as you might imagine. Uh, we should have probably done this a few years earlier, but Hindsight is 2020, as they say. But uh, nevertheless, you know, we, we made our first game. It was a, a small uh, city builder called 1849. We, we shipped that in one year, in 2014. Uh, we were also working on a second game, which we shipped last year, called Project High Rise. We released that. Um, and you know, uh, knocking on wood, this will allow us to make a third game, and so on. The, and the point of this thing is, the, the numbers are showing that the market is changing, and it's a tough market. It's tough for different reasons than it used to be, but we're still working on this. We're still trying to make this into a uh, business and uh, a, a, an opportunity for us to, to make games and make a living off of it. And so are you, right? I mean, we are all in this sort of together. We're all, we all have the same goal of making this viable for us. So let's figure out how can we together deal with this situation. So the meat of the talk is going to be three sections. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about discoverability, how things have changed and how we can adjust ourselves to that. Uh, then I'm going to hand this clicker over to Matt, who's going to talk about uh, self-publishing and how uh, that is changing. And then uh, he's going to talk about the effects on studio and team organization. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. So. Discoverability is a sort of a perennial problem for, for all of us, uh, and it has for a long time, right? And when I talk about discoverability, discoverability, it's the problem of getting eyeballs on the game. So how do we get players to, to find out about our game and to know that this is actually something that exists that they, they want to play? Because we all know that we're making games for players. Like, there are players out there who will want our games, right? We just need to find them. Uh, no matter how small a game, there are people who will want it. But how do they find out about it? And that, that's been uh, the, the standard problem all along. And this, there are sort of two parts of it. One is discovering from the outside, you know, bringing people into, the, into your web page, storefront, whatever. And then discoverability from the inside. Like once they're in a store, 
again, whether it's iTunes or Steam or Google Play or GOG or whatever, how do they find out about this game once they're there? And discoverability is always hard for indies because all media follow a very like power law like distribution where the, the big guys get all the attention and they get all the, you know, they get the players, they get the money and so on. And the smaller uh, studios or smaller teams uh, end up in the so-called long tail. The idea of the long tail, as you know, is that given a electronic distribution media where it's cheap to distribute things, hopefully uh, the small players will be able to um, uh, sell a smaller number of games, but to people who are interested. So for indies, you know, we're, if we're looking at this long tail, we're somewhere, somewhere on the floor over there, right? Um, and uh, the challenge for us is to find those players who will learn about us because we don't have the marketing budgets of the big guys. Uh, tradition, so we're, talk, we're gonna talk about pulling people from the outside in a little bit. Now let's first talk about uh, getting people to discover the game once they're on the store page. Uh, and traditionally this means getting featured in some way, whether it's getting featured through a uh, featuring slot that's hand created or maybe something like a top 10 list or new releases list and so on. And if you go and uh, log into Steam or another store, you will see this kind of a long list of different things that the store is telling you about. And a lot of the thinking is about how do we, how do we get ourselves featured on this? And what I'm gonna say is maybe that's, that's not the, the uh, focus anymore because the amount of featuring that's actually likely to, to happen to us is relatively small. If we look at what happens when the player logs into Steam, opens up you know, their Steam client and they're going to go play a game, but before they do that, they wanna look at their store and, and see what's there. They're gonna see the stuff above the fold first, right? And that's the sort of newspaper metaphor, right? Like if you have a newspaper, you see it in a store, the stuff above the fold is the stuff right below the masthead, and then the other stuff you don't see necessarily immediately. Uh, so above the fold, we have some featuring slots, which is, which is very good. Uh, in fact, right now, there are 12 of them in a carousel that flips back and forth. Uh, and that's the stuff that the player will f see first. These are the featured and recommended games uh, or maybe manually curated and so on. Then if the player scrolls further down, they're gonna see additional featuring slots. So they might see a special offer section, for example. And these things change, right? Some things go up, some things go down. In, in a section like this, maybe there will be six games, maybe there will be 12 games and so on. Then the question is, if the player was to be scrolling further down and so on, they would probably see more featuring slots, right? But uh, what, I, what I would actually say is that they won't, right? Those other ones don't really matter so much because if a player is going to the store page to play a game, they're just gonna play a game. They might see something above the fold, but they're not gonna go keep exploring. They will go exploring only if there's a sale or something special going on. So what we're really talking about is the featuring slots that matter in any store are the top ones. And there's a limited number of them, very small, finite number of them. So what this means is that for featuring, for bringing players in from inside the store into our page, we're running into two sort of competing forces or, or two forces that are both working against us. One, the larger the stores grow, the more players they get, which means that each of those featuring slots becomes more valuable because there are more eyeballs looking at it. Therefore, those featuring slots are gonna go to the best sellers, obviously because you know, that's, that's, how people, that's how we make money, right? And then the second force is that the more games there are on stores, the less likely statistically each game is to get one of those featuring slots. So these are two kind of forces that work against small developers such as ourselves from, from getting uh, visibility inside a store. So what happens in a situation like this is storefronts develop different strategies. And we've seen this with any other storefronts uh, that have a huge inventory of product, digital products such as Amazon, Netflix, and so on. They all end up going towards algorithmic recommendations. And indeed, Steam has been doing the same. So algorithmic recommendations do the sort of thing of, they look at what you've played before, and then they give you a recommendation based on that. And this is very good, as instead of human curation, now you have uh, an electronic system that tells you, hey, if you like this, you might like that. And here's an example, right? 
uh, I was logging in, into uh, my Steam client the other day, and it tells me right up front, hey, there's this new game called Stellar Monarch. You play strategy games and simulation games and forex games and indie games. Why don't you try this one? So I thought to myself, why don't I try this one? And this sounds, sounds good. So even without doing any research, just based on this, I went and purchased it and loved it. It was great. I mean, and I was so happy that the automated system gave me this recommendation right up top above the fold, because otherwise I would never have discovered it. Um, and it's an indie game. Uh, it, I think it's like a one or two person team. And what are the chances that they would, give, they would have been selected by a, a human curation process? Probably fairly low, but the automation system uh, recommended it to me, and I was very happy with the result. And we see Steam sort of uh, going further with that, right? They're, they're sort of continuing with that, and in fact, right now, looking at the uh, uh, featuring slots above the fold, about half of them right now are algorithmically selected. So, what does this mean? This has uh, an effect on us, right? As we make games, we have to think about all right, if we're going to be uh, looking for uh, discoverability within a store, how do we make life easier for ourselves to be discovered using these al through these algorithms? How do we make ourselves algorithm friendly? Um, and here's the thing, uh, recommendation algorithms, whether they're uh, uh, Steams or Amazons or Netflix or whatever, they based on some kind of similar similarity metrics, right? There's always a tension inside them. So Amazon might work on purchase history, Netflix might work on stars, Steam might work on tags and purchase history, etc. In any case, there's always this tension between, on one hand, looking at your history and giving you more of the same, more of what you've already played, and also, on the other hand, doing uh, exploration, right? Given what you've played, maybe you want to try something very different that you wouldn't think of trying out yourself. And this is a tension that historically tends to swing towards giving you more of the same. Uh, just because it's easier to know, given your history, you know, given my history of strategy simulation, forex, indie, that I'm gonna like these kinds of games. And sure enough, I keep getting them over and over. Uh, but who knows, maybe there's a racing, farming, indie, uh, 2D game out there that I would really love, and chances are I would, right? Because I like my racing games every now and then. I like my farming games every now and then. Uh, but it's hard for the algorithms to know that this is the combo for me. So here's my postulate. Uh, I think that what we're gonna see with recommendation systems is that it's gonna be easier for niche games and genre games to get recommended to players, and it's going to be harder for uh, esoteric games or games that span, span multiple genres and multiple uh, niches to get recommended. Uh, we'll see how this plays out, for sure. Uh, but if this is the case, then you know, niches are starting to become more powerful. In fact, we have ourselves defined ourselves as a, as a genre studio, not because of this. Uh, back in 2013, our thinking was, you know, we like simulation games, we like strategy games, we're, we're gonna concentrate on those because we like them and we think we're good at them. And you know, it's even in the name, Soma Sim, right? Uh, but it's been an interesting kind of a, an experience to follow through with this and see how this grows. So if, you are, if this is something that you are considering, a couple, of thing, couple uh, words about targeting a niche. One, uh, niches are sort of recapitulating the same difficulties of the larger market, right? You're still competing against uh, a number of games that are kind of similar to each other, uh, and they're, you're still competing for eyeballs, just on a smaller scale. And niches do get very faddish. They get uh, uh, you know, based on style, right? If you're, if you're right now releasing a prog gen game, you're great. But if you're just starting working on a prog gen, prog -gen open world sandbox or something like that, where will the market be when you finish this? So this is something that we've uh, sort of thought of through the process of development of our last game, and it's something that, that stays on our mind. You always have to be several years ahead of the market, and in niches specifically, like how are the fads going to go? Um, so always have to look at the future, and also uh, the other thing that was kind of surprising to us, but in retrospect shouldn't have been, is that niches are communities, they have, own, they have their own sets of expectations, they have their own ideas about anything from UI uh, conventions to uh, mechanics to 
uh, systems and so on. So you have to be aware of them uh, because otherwise you're going to get very vocal feedback about that. So it, it helps to be a player inside that niche. All right, so we talked about a lot about recommendation systems and how, uh, how to look at discoverability inside the store. And I'm going to uh, wrap up quickly looking at discoverability from the outside. So the problem of bringing eyeballs from the, the sort of outside world looking at your game. And that's, that's a problem that, does, that never went away, right? It's always been a problem. Uh, word of mouth is obviously the best way to get, uh, to get recommendations. The thing that we've seen uh, becoming very, very, very important has been YouTube and Twitch. And specifically, things like, again, if we're looking at genres and, uh, and uh, specific kind of uh, styles of games, look at communities that's, that orient around them. For example, Project High Rise again, uh, before we released the game, we sent out uh, keys to, YouTube, to YouTubers, Twitch players, and so on. And we were very lucky to be picked up to catch the interest of a few players who specifically play simulation strategy games. And they had audiences who specifically look for simulation strategy games. So that was a sort of a match made in heaven. We were lucky enough to attract their attention, and from that, uh, players who look for these kinds of games learn about them, learn about our game. So we got you know, some, some number of hundreds of thousands of views on these, on these videos that they made. And that's a huge number, right? Like, one, just the number itself is big, and two, the audience is looking for these kinds of games. This is a different audience than a mass market audience. So this was very, very interesting and very valuable. So in summary of this section, uh, when we look at discoverability and getting our game out, uh, you know, getting eyeballs on our game and so on, I think the traditional ways of things like getting uh, uh, selected by curators is going to be less likely. Things like new releases lists are going to be much less valuable just because of the velocity, right? We've seen the numbers, uh, new releases lists, get, showing up on those is no longer useful. Um, but what is going to be increasingly important, I think, is one, becoming algorithm friendly. So keeping this in our mind from the very beginning of the design process, how do we make our game easier to be discovered for people? And two, bringing in outside traffic from genre specific audiences such as uh, YouTubers, Let's Players, and so on, who specialize in these kinds of games. So that's that for my discoverability section. Now I'm gonna hand this over to Matt, who's gonna talk about parts two and three. Thank you. Excellent. Wasn't Rob great? Thanks, Rob. <laughs> so Rob started to touch on um, how do you get traffic from outside of the stores into your site? How do you start building up the number of eyeballs that you get on your game? And that's where I'd like to move next in my next section as we go the right way in the slide deck. So I want to talk about publishing, about how the numbers that we've seen, the 6,000 games that are going to come out this year added on to the 12,000 games that are already on Steam, how that impacts publishing and getting eyeballs on. But before we look at 2017, I want to go back in time to the halcyon days of 2011 when there were a few hundred games that came out every year on Steam. And back in those days, who needs publishers? We're indies. We're just going to put our game out there and we'll put it up on Steam, on IndieDB, on Desura. Then we'll flog it to death on social media. We'll get a lot of traffic. People will buy our game. It'll be awesome. We'll make another one. It's Indie Paradise. Yay. Except that's not really true anymore. And I also would argue that in 2011, that wasn't really true either. Platforms like Valve, like iTunes, like Google were picking games that they liked as curators. They were putting them on prominent featuring slots. They were doing a lot of promotion. They were driving a lot of traffic there. Sounds like a publisher to me, but that's just me. So. To come back to 2017, we've changed things a lot. Valve is now acting like an online store. There's a loose selection process that's getting looser and looser all the time. And it's up to us as the developers, as the people who make the games, to drive traffic, to get the eyeballs in the game, to do the work that they were sort of doing for us in 2011. And I'd like to take a break for a moment and talk about the future of Steam. Because Steam for us, at least for us as PC make developers, is an important platform. So let's look at where Steam thinks they want to go in the future. Back in 2013, around the time we saw that inflection point, 
where things began to change, uh, Gabe Newell said the following thing, and I want to read this one verbatim. If we're thinking about this correctly, anybody should be able to publish anything through Steam, where Steam is just a whole bunch of servers and network bandwidth. Sink in, sink in, sink in. Okay. So then this sort of came true last month, um, or I guess it's still this month, um, when Steam announced Steam Direct. So they're now getting rid of the green light process that we saw in 2013 around that inflection point. And now we see our goal is to provide developers and publishers with a more direct publishing path and ultimately connect gamers with even more great content. So basically, Steam's vision of where their platform should be in the future is the exact opposite of where it was in 2011. They don't want to do the curation. They don't want to do the selection. They want to let the market do that. The games that sell well will be the games that get the featuring. So it's up to us to start to think about how we're going to get those sales, how we're going to get those eyeballs onto our games. And that becomes our job now. So can you still do this kind of self-publishing that was being done in 2011? Um, you can put the game up on stores, but you've got to remember there are going to be 6,000 other people who are going to release new games next year, and that doesn't include things like DLCs and content packs and stripe, sprite packs and everything else that junks up the front page and the release thing on Steam. So there's that. Can you flog it on social media? Sure, but you've been on social media lately, right? <laughs> it's kind of a dumpster fire. So good luck with that. Um, so what are we talking about? What, what's the solution here? Um, we still need to do this real PR, this real marketing that has to be done. And again, since Valve is no longer limiting the number of games and they want to broaden them, that becomes even more important. It requires a great deal of skill. It requires connections. You need to have that person at Valve, at Apple, at GOG that picks up your email, that replies to you in order to help get that featuring going. So what I'm saying is this becomes a full-time job. This is something that is really increasingly important. But what if you're terrible at it, like us? Um, it's dangerous out there, so you should take some help with you. So we think you should hire the right person for the job. When we made 1849 in 2013, our first game, we decided we need to do audio. Let's go ahead and do audio. We can do that ourselves. Um, I had never done audio before. I have no idea how to do it. Rob had never done audio before either. He had no idea how to do it, but we didn't let that stop us, and we did it anyway. And sure enough, when the game went out there, we got a lot of replies in forum posts with things like, those cows are terrible. Make the cows stop. Why is there so much mooing? Why is the mixing like that? So when we came time for us to do Project High Rise, I think the third thing we did was find somebody to do the audio for our game, because we're not good at it. It's not a skill set that we have native to our team. And we think that you should hire the right person for the right job, if that's audio, if that's art, or if that's marketing. And so am I talking about the return of the publisher? Because, you know, we're indies. Like, publishing and hiring a publisher sort of gives us all the creeps a little bit. But those numbers that Rob went over, those huge influx of games under the market, they haven't just changed us as developers. They've changed publishers, too. So publishers have also changed. They've evolved. Back in the battle days of 2006, we had old school publishers who did things like this, and most of those things are fine, but I'm an indie dev and I really hate those last two. Take the majority of the revs and own the IP. I made the game, I want the revs. I made the game, I want the IP. We've seen a new wave of publishers come on the scene that are willing to do help for marketing, that are willing to do help for PR, that have Twitch and YouTube connections, that just take a cut of the revenues and don't own the IP, which sounds great. And we've seen a lot of indies begin to work with these kind of new school publishers. But how do we evaluate them? Like, I know how to evaluate an artist, a 3D artist, a 2D artist. I know how to evaluate a sound person, how to evaluate somebody to work with us to help code the game. How do you evaluate a publishing partner? Like, how do you know if they're right for your game? So, some things to consider. Does their target audience match yours? Did they put out eight, 10 strategy simulation games in the past couple of years? If so, they have eight or 10 games worth of players that are right in your niche, right in your genre, to, sell your, to market your game to. That's one thing. Do they have good distributor relationships? When you go on to Steam and there's like a, they do the publisher's weekends, do you see them show up as one of them? Do you see the games be um, featured in those? You, that means that they have an email, they have a contact at the publisher that you can work and that is valuable for you. 
Do they have a good player reputation? Like when you go on to discussion boards, do you see the publishers interacting in addition to the devs with players? Do players respond positively to their games when they come out? Um, what are the reviews? What are the, what's the situation for the other games that they've published? Do they have a good game reputation within our community as game devs? Like when you come to a conference like GDC and you say, hey, we're thinking about working with these guys, is the reaction, oh yeah, they're great people, you should definitely work with them, or is it, ooh, you should talk to Rob. That's not a good reaction that you get. So what's the reputation like within the game dev community? And do they, oh, sorry, do they fund games? Do you need the funding? If so, that's a very important consideration. So there are also some parasites out there. So be careful and look out for these publishers who will take your game, tweet about it eight times on release day, send 20 keys to YouTubers and say, we published our game, that'll be, your game, that'll be 20%. You can do that yourself and keep the 20%. So they also have a bad reputation among players. Players know who the shovelware publishers are, so just avoid that, the nail on the head. So just to summarize this section a little bit, Self-publishing is not as easy as it used to be anymore. Standing out in this crowded market where you have 6,000 games coming out next year is going to be even more difficult than it used to be. So if you're not good at it, outsource it. It's what we would do for any other skill set that we don't possess natively to our team. And we need to start thinking about these things like PR, like marketing, like how we're going to get the eyeballs on the game as crucial parts of the game development process, not things that we'll do later once we're done. Okay, so that said, I would like to talk about how we can work together better as developers, how we can change the way that we relate to one another within our teams, and how we can use that to help cut through this noise as well, and how we can use that to increase the number of eyeballs. When we're talking about getting people to pay attention to us, to follow our games, People follow other people. When I want to find a new piece of music or a new book or something like that, I don't follow a publisher or a platform or a studio. I follow a musician or an author or a group or a TV star. I follow the people who are behind making the product, who are behind the creative voice. So they stand out by emphasizing their own creative voice and we can stand out by emphasizing our creative voice. And as indie developers, we need to do a better job at this. What I'm saying is we need to find our inner Kubricks. You can always tell a Kubrick movie. Everybody knows that's The Shining. Yes? I hope. Okay. So this is sort of that iconic scene from The Shining where the, he's racing down the hallway on the big wheel and the camera's right behind him and it's sharp corners, the suspense builds until he runs into the creepy twins and they say, come play with us. The creepy scene. It's a very Kubrick. And if I tell you that a movie you haven't seen before is a Kubrick movie, you already know a lot about, if you know Kubrick, you already know a lot about that movie before you even see the movie. We recognize Kubrick in the work. So how do players recognize you and me in our games? So like if when Cliff Harris puts out a new Positech game, it comes out just by knowing that it's a Cliff Harris Positech game, I already know lots about it. In fact, when he put production line out for the alpha, I bought it right away because I knew I would like it. When a new Zactronics game comes out, know a lot about that already just because they've done a good job of establishing that creative voice and that creative style. And I'm talking about like you and we as in the whole team of people, not just us as the main developers, but ourselves, the people who did our audio, the people who did our sound. They need credit, they need recognition because giving that to them increases everybody's bandwidth, increases the volume of our creative voice collectively. And I wanna take an example from a different area, from restaurants. We live in Chicago, and there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of restaurants in Chicago with new ones opening every week. It's a crowded, volatile market that should sound familiar to us. And within Mexican restaurants, it's an even deeper problem because there are lots and lots and lots of Mexican restaurants in Chicago, so it's a crowded niche. And that's Chef Rick Bayless, who you may know from his PBS cooking show. Um, and he does a really good job, because he has a little empire of Mexican restaurants in Chicago, of cutting through the noise of restaurants. When he opened a new torta restaurant, we went there right away, not because it was a new torta restaurant, but because it was Rick Bayless's restaurant. And he also does a really good job of working with and encouraging people he works with. That's Ansel Moramirez, who Rick Bayless calls the king of mole. He makes the best Mexican sauces I've ever had in my life. So 
And he talks about it on his cooking shows, in the media, whenever he's asked questions like, who are you following, who are you working with? He encourages and promotes the people that he works with. So when Chef Ramirez opened a new restaurant, which is conveniently around the corner from my house, um, we couldn't get in for three months. So that kind of amplification of not just his own bandwidth, but then helping his coworkers, his people he works with, is sort of a way of you can, like, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and that means that we need to think about providing an equal share in rewards as well, so that people who contribute to your game to its success, um, and everybody contributes to that voice, gets to enjoy the fruits of the labor. So if you're working on a contract, if you're working for a company, you're getting a paycheck, but is it what you're passionate about? Not necessarily. How does that increase your creative voice? How does that get you going? How does that get you talking? Um, and for us, that means everyone we work with, we work with on a rev share basis. So that leads to a long tail of revenues that sort of lifts all of the boats and helps everyone become more independent with each game that comes out. And that's abstract, so here are some specifics. This is the sales chart for our first game, 1849, and we're gonna ignore that big bump at the beginning and look how we have the months of sales that come after that. That's the long tail that helped us as developers, but also our artists that we worked with make Project High Rise, which came out, and we have, again, we're, hopefully there's that big bump at the beginning, and then we're seeing the beginning of a long tail show up that's going to let us, the people we worked with, our artists, become more independent with each successive game that we release. And more independence helps us develop our creative voice. It helps us start to break through this noise together as a team. So these RevShare teams that we're talking about, like let's look into them a little bit more and how we do it. All contributors participate in the spoils. So we take the big chunk of money that comes in, hopefully it's a big chunk of money, and it's per title, so per game that comes out. And then it's done by proportional contribution. So my hour is worth the same as Rob's hour, it's worth the same as our artist's hour. We total the number of hours that were done, and if I work 35% of the hours, I get 35% of the revenue. Um, and that's worked for us for two games so far. And it was inspired by Randy Smith from Tiger Style, and you can go see his talk from 2013, from which I stole most of this slide. So, some challenges. These things aren't really fish nor fowl. It's not a traditional contracting relationship. It's not a salary, but it's somewhere in between. So there's some challenges to this model. How do you find the right people? Um, how do you find the person who's willing to you know, work for two years and maybe get paid later? It's risky, like no one knows if the game's gonna succeed. Like one way you could do that to help mitigate things is to offer some sort of advance on royalties, but then you need the money up front to do that and that's sometimes hard to find. And they have to trust, you have to trust that they can deliver what they say without the motivation, the carrot of a salary to help drive their work. And they have to trust that you're going to deliver and that your game can make enough revenue to make it worth their while and that you pay them and stuff. Um, so we're really talking about a limited pool. Uh, Ex-colleagues, friends, people you know, people who you can talk into taking the rev share plunge with you. And that's kind of a problem, that local pool. Um, we only find our collaborators locally. Like when I start working on my next game, I'll find my collaborators through people that I've worked with before, at different jobs, different games, or through the network of indies in Chicago. But how can we sort of shift that to be more global in collaboration? How can we like, find that guy who's waiting to do art for our game that would be perfect for it in Sweden, that can do rev share? Why do I need to know about that artist? They should know about me. How do we shift these collaborations, these networks, to be more global? And unfortunately, there's not a slide with an answer coming up. That's sort of a problem that I want to put out there for us as a community to think about. How can we start to shift the way that we work from our local networks to more global networks. Um, so that's something we want to leave you with today and hopefully start a conversation about that going forward. So sort of to wrap up this section a little bit, um, our players want our game, hopefully, not just any game. They want the game that we're putting out next that we've been talking about, that we've been encouraging our artists, our audio people, our whole team to talk about and to get passionate about and to really develop our next game. And independence is what, is, what let us, is what lets us develop that creative voice. 
Being indies is our strength. It's what's going to help us get through the noise. It's not what's going to keep us from getting through it. By emphasizing and maintaining our independence, that's what's going to help us get through the noise. That's what's going to help us cut through this 6,000 games that are coming out next year. We need to maintain that. We need to strengthen it. We need to reinforce it. And again, that distinct voice is what's going to let us get through the noise. So we're going to wrap up with whatever that is. And look at a few conclusions before we jump to some questions, which we've hopefully left enough time for. I think you can summarize our talk by the theme of the following. Noise changes everything. The number of games that have come out last year and in the past few years and that we're going to see coming, we can't stop. They're going to add on to the games that are already out there. The noise level is going to increase dramatically in the coming years. How do we deal with that? Hopefully we come up with some suggestions today that can help us deal with that. You need to develop, to develop a unique voice that players will seek out. Structure your team so that everybody that you work with becomes more independent. Structure your team so that we're all becoming more independent as we go forward and all developing that creative voice. Find partners to amplify your voice. If you're bad at PR, if you're bad at marketing, if you're bad at those things like I am, um, those skill sets aren't native to your team. Find people who can help you. Find people who can do that. It's an important core skill set in this new world. And finally, we need to plan for how players are going to find our games from the very first commit of code to our game. We need to know how they're going to get through the store, how a player's going to find them, how are we going to do that kind of discoverability, not later on, but as we're developing the game from those very early concept stages. So hopefully we now know how we can survive this post-apocalyptic world a little bit better, and we'd welcome some questions, and you should all come see us in Chicago. So if anyone has any questions, please go to the mic in the center aisle. Hi. Hey. Um, so you mentioned following people as opposed mm -hmm. to following brands, mm -hmm. but then you also mentioned collective voice of a studio as opposed to an individual voice. How do you put those two together? I mean, I think we're looking at it sort of from the indie perspective, like, you know, our, this, is, this is our studio. Um, and I think we have to look at it more like a band, like we're a band, you know, like we're people who have come together to make this album and that's our game. So I think, you know, we're not talking about like a big studio like Blizzard or something like that. Like, you know, think of yourself more like a band and, you know, everybody knows the guitarist, the drummer and stuff like that. So I think we need to think more like that, like, there's the drummer, there's the guitarist, there's the lead singer, and we're all sort of coming together as a band to make an album, which is our game. And, and if, actually, if I, can, if I can follow up on that, I think it works in both ways. Uh, I, the, and there's also a point about like, what to focus on. For some people, uh, it might be a, a single person who's sort of fronting everything and, and they're developing their uh, recogni recognition. Uh, for teams, like for example, uh, you know, Zektronics came up before. Uh, and that's one person who works with collaborators, so that's, that's sort of, it, it works behind a team name. And I think they, these both work. Uh, the, the major distinction is that they have a recognizable voice. Uh, these are not teams that, for example, switch from genre to genre. They don't sort of try a lot of, you know, uh, 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 they don't have a, an unrecognizable style. They have a style, and the style hides, uh, not hides, but is represented either by a team name or, a, or by a person name, and that's, that, that recognition of a style is the important part. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so you, so you talk about uh, how new school publishers are not funding games in the same way that old school publishers were. And you also talk about how there's, on the Steam at least, a linear increase in consumers versus a quadratic increase in the supply of games. Uh, this seems to imply that uh, market forces are going to squeeze out a lot of people who have less money, and that, uh, or it, it could happen, um, and that most of the games that are going to be able to achieve success are games that are going to be made by people who are basically richer. Um, a lot of people cannot afford to work for two years 
on the promise of revenue, um, some amount of capital is needed. And if publishers are not providing it, where can that capital come from in this current world? There's been you know, a lot of hand-wringing about uh, the viability of, of um, crowdfunding and whatnot, and uh, in particular how it's not viable. It's not something that you guys really touched on at all. So I'm wondering yeah. if you had any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it's, in a certain sense, it's a very similar situation to how it's been all along, right? That um, f for indies, it's really hard to, to find funding, uh, and people end up self-funding because they have to. Uh, and sometimes when you have, uh, you know, some, sometimes you might be able to get something like PR marketing help and so on uh, on, a re on a ref share basis, for example, so you don't have to uh, pay up front, but uh, the, the PR person will take a cut of the cost. But the problem of getting funding for a game is, is always a hard one. It used to be much easier to, if you had a, uh, if you made a game to then uh, you know, release it without publishing and recoup the costs uh, in an easier way, but but now it's harder, right? Now it's um, so I, I guess uh, the answer to that is that like in any other small business, right? You need to have some kind of uh, seed capital to start with, and that's and I mean that ends up being somebody's savings, right? Whether it's savings being spent on a contract or whether it's savings being spent on rent while you work in your basement for two years, right? Um, I don't think there's a good way to get around that, but also I don't think there's ever been a good way to get around that. Unfortunately. Thank you. All right, I've got a two-part question for Dr. Z. Um, so, you had suggested that uh, increasingly uh, getting surfaced for algorithmic recommendation uh, recommendations was an area of focus, and it's going to be increasingly important on Steam. How do you know that you're succeeding on that? Do you get impression or funnel statistics uh, from recommendation servicing? The second part is uh, you had mentioned that it favors niche games. It seems like a lot of recent innovation has come from like genre mashups. How do you succeed in getting a mashup recommended? Yeah, so uh, to answer the first question, um, uh, there are no numbers publicly available right now, unfortunately. So we, so we can't do... It's a uh, guessing game. Yeah, we, we can't really do analytics on that. Uh, I would love it if there were numbers. I mean, that would be so amazing. Um, so I think one thing that's going to be useful going forward is using a service like Steam Spy, for example. You can uh, collect, uh, for example, data on how many games are tagged with different tags and how many and what their sales were like. And you could potentially do your own manual matchup of like, you know, hey, games that are strategy simulation have been growing, and games that are strategy farming 2D racing have been declining. Um, but that's not going to be uh, possible f at least for another year, because Steam has only recently been uh, um, uh, sort of getting really, uh, you know, doubling down on this algorithmic recommendation. And I apologize, I forgot the second one. <laughs> Sorry. Second question is like, uh, you had mentioned that. Uh, recommendations favor niche-based games. Um, and it seems like that's counter to a lot of recent innovation that's been really mashup-based. Like, how do you build a mashup that can also get recommended? I yes. guess that's the question. And yeah. maybe it's more of a rhetorical, like, it's hard. Yeah. It's a fine answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to, I, I think you have to start with a strong, like start, start in a niche that's already strong, and then hopefully that it sort of broadens out. Like, I think you still have to try to target the niche to begin with. And then hopefully that allows you to broaden out, and as you know, it gets more pickup and more word of mouth in other communities, then hopefully you can leverage other community. I think you'd be strongest by trying to focus on your core niche and then move to the neighboring one and start to like, you know, take over the, ne take over the, na the neighbors. Cool. Thanks. And that looks to me like yeah, we're out of time. Yeah, it looks like time. that wraps it up. Thank you so much, <laughs> Robert and Matt. Thank you. Thank you.